Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, Father, for the immense blessings that you have poured out on this small church in just the short time that we have been gathered. And now we're excited, Father, for what you're doing in a new chapter, and we're, we're looking forward to what that will bring. New people, new energy, new strength, new opportunity. Father, prepare our hearts for it. Prepare us to each in our own way enter into that season in a way that lets us learn even as we help others learn, serve even as others serve us, contribute our time and our talent and our treasure along with those around us so that, Father, whatever you see fit in doing through us at this location, we may be a small part of it with you. We thank you for the privilege that it is to serve alongside others called to the same outcome. And, Father, as we begin to think about those things. We know we need to prepare. We're going to have men and women in this room with us who have questions, who need to know the Scripture, who want to understand how to live out what they're hearing, who are challenged by it. And they may not ask Steve the questions. They may not ask Toby the question. They may ask each individual person here who might get that question. We ask, Lord, that you'd prepare us all in what we're studying to be ready to answer them. And in years to come, Father, you grow up a community here that can meet, reach this city with the truth of what's in your word. Thank you for the privilege to be part of that work. Help us understand Matthew tonight, Father. Help us to use it to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's transition out of our study of the first reason why Jesus was rejected by Israel. That's what we've been looking at now. And we're going to get into the second reason. There's two altogether, and we're into the second one now. Just to remind you, the first one we learned already was that the hard and unrepentant hearts of the people of Israel rejected Jesus for that reason. They didn't turn, they didn't repent from that system of of religious ritual and rules that they were wedded to that we call Pharisaic Judaism. They didn't want to put that aside so they can embrace the kingdom. And we learned last week that the Father in heaven chose not to uh, change the situation. He chose not to change their hearts so that they might make that switch. And in doing so, he sent his son to the cross. So that's the first reason. But we're moving on from that now to the second reason. And the second reason for Jesus' rejection is closely related to the first in that it also finds its origins in Pharisaic Judaism. But the second reason involves a different group of people. We're not going to be looking at the crowd so much now. Instead, we're looking at the religious leaders over the people, the rabbis, the authorities. Now remember, Israel as a nation was formed by a religious law that was given to Israel by God himself through Moses, the covenant that we all think of when we think of the Mosaic Covenant. That was their constitution. That was their declaration of independence. That's what took a bunch of slaves out of Egypt and made a nation out of them at Mount Sinai. All right? But because the law that formed them was a religious law, for that reason also then all the authorities in their government structure were religious authorities. So the highest authority in the land was the high priest not a president. This is certainly before kings came along, but even after the king came along, the high priest was a higher authority than even the king in in matters of law. And then you had judges, and then you had lawyers and scribes, and all of those were rabbis. They were all teachers of the law. They were all religious authorities. So in Jesus' day, that still was the case, only the religious authorities of his day had taken on a certain name. They were called Pharisees. Pharisees. So we begin our study tonight with Jesus highlighting The difference between what he was offering Israel and what the Pharisees in their system of Pharisaic Judaism, what it was offering to the people of Israel. We pick up there in verse 28 of chapter 11. Jesus says to the crowd, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That brings us to the end of chapter 11. And I assume for the most part, you guys have heard that phrase before. My yoke is easy, right? My burden is light. That's a very familiar statement for most of us. But unless you understand exactly what Jesus is saying here in this context, those words might actually sound opposite to the truth, at least in some situations. For example, I would not recommend that you quote this passage to a Christian friend who's enduring some great trial or persecution, right? It's going to offer them very little comfort if you turn to them in the middle of that trial and say, oh, Jesus' yoke is light, it's easy. Because, friends, the truth is that obeying Christ in a fallen world sometimes, if not often, means enduring trials that are hard, that are not easy at all. 
Which is why you have to understand his words here in a specific sense. That is the sense he intended in this context. And what is the context? It is him contrasting what he is offering to Israel with what Pharisaic Judaism was offering. Take my yoke is a rabbinical figure of speech. It was in use in Jesus' day by other rabbis commonly. And what it means was attending school. That's what the phrase meant. Rabbis would invite new students to join their rabbinical training program as students underneath them by saying to the students, take my yoke. And what that literally meant was, come learn under me. And if you want proof of that, look what Jesus said in the text. He actually uses both the phrase, the the figure of speech, and he translates it. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's what he's saying to the crowd. Come be part of my training. Now, the fact that rabbis in that day would compare joining a rabbinical school to the shouldering of a yoke that used to you know, be on oxen, well, that tells you a lot of what it was like to live under Pharisaic Judaism. It's no coincidence that they chose that euphemism to describe what it meant to learn. The burdens of their system were immense, and they are altogether unimaginable for you and me today. You have no idea. The life of a Pharisee was scripted by thousands of rules that addressed every aspect of their daily activity. These guys prayed multiple times a day on time, on certain schedules. They fasted several times a week, regularly. They performed washings throughout the day, before and after meals and all different times. They memorized thousands of lines of text, most of it out of the Mishnah, not out of the Scripture, or both, actually. I mean, their life was just unimaginably scripted by these kinds of things. From the moment the guy would wake up to the moment he put his head on the pillow at night, he was under the burden of this yoke, and he felt it. Even the word Pharisee itself reflects what it was like to live under those rules. It comes from an old Aramaic word that means a separated one. A separated one. Because the effect of Pharisaic life was to separate that man from everyone else in Jewish society. They were in their own little world. So a new rabbinical student would hear a Pharisee or a rabbi say to him, take up my yoke, and it was a reminder to that man who was considering joining of the difficult burdens he was signing up for, of the way of life. You know, Today it's like, what do we say when you want to be a Marine? What's the phrase they use? I don't even remember now what it is. It's not like no one, you know, not everyone can be a Marine. I don't know what it is, but it's something to the effect of like, this is hard. It's only for the best of you, you know? The whole idea is to make you feel like, I want to be part of that. If it's hard and it's difficult and most people can't qualify, well, that's for me. You know, it's kind of jujitsu, turn it on its head, make it sound different, you know, make something hard sound appealing. Then you have Jesus. Jesus says, yeah, take up my yoke instead. Oh, but then he adds, mine won't be hard. Mine's easy. Mine's light. He came offering freedom from following strenuous religious systems that are based on rule-keeping every hour of the day. Because by faith in Christ, you get this is the best thing in the world, friends. By faith in Christ, you instantly gain credit in heaven for the very thing that the religious are striving to achieve, righteousness. God just gives it to you. You know, It's like he does the test for you, and you get 100%, and you didn't even have to study. That's what he's talking about. Jesus accomplished everything required by God's law. So by your faith in him, the Bible says, God gives you credit for all of Christ's work on your behalf. That's what he meant when he said his burden is light and easy. He's already done the work. He's already done the law. And beyond that, he also paid the law's price for the sin that we have. So he lives a perfect life under the law to complete its requirements, and then he goes to the cross to pay the price for breaking the law, which he then gives us on our behalf. So by faith, you get credit for both, the perfect life of Christ and the atoning sacrificial death on your behalf. Friends, you cannot get much easier and lighter than that. That's the yoke he was offering. Now, by contrast, the yoke of Pharisaic Judaism meant trying to keep the law. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. They weren't satisfied with that. That wasn't hard enough for them. On top of the 613 whatever commandments of the law, then they added thousands of additional rules, Pharisaic rules, that then came on top of trying to keep the law. And in most cases, they just replaced the law. That, friends, is nothing if not endless burden. Endless burden. Because here's the worst part about it. It does not matter how well you kept it today. When you wake up, Tomorrow, 
you start over. It's all facing you again that day and the next day and the next day. It never ends. That's the burden that the Jews of Christ's day knew. And Jesus said he was prepared to free them from that burden if they would receive him. Moreover, he explains why his system is so different. He says, my system, if you want to use that term, my solution, my offer, he says, is so light because he says, I am gentle and I am humble in heart. I love that. I love that he gives that explanation because what he's saying is this. Christ as God, and we know he is the son of God. He had this heart, this genuine desire to help God's people obey. That is the heart of God. To help us. To help us obey. It is not as though God has set up some kind of test by the law and said, let's see how far you can go with this. The point was to find a way around that problem for us. He wants us to do the right thing. That's the heart of God, to help us to be like Him. And the plan of salvation that God authored for us reflects His love for us. It is a humble, gentle plan. You know, when Christ came, He came, as, the, as Paul says in Philippians 2, in a humble fashion. Paul says in Philippians 2, 5, that we ought to think like Jesus and live like Jesus in that sense. He says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You don't get much more humble than that. Meanwhile, contrast that with the Pharisees. Pharisees were prideful, arrogant, unloving men who cared nothing for God's people and only for their own uh, advancement. Far from being humble, they took pride in the fact that they had a rigorous lifestyle and they wore the burdens that they had in their lifestyle. They wore them like a badge of honor. Why do you think they stood on street corners and prayed in public? Do you know that, that criticism Christ made of them, that they prayed in public all the time? Why do you think, why does anyone do things like that in public? It's so that you would say, oh, look at that man. He's got such a terrible burden. He's so pious. Look at all that hard work he does. Right? For the approval of men. I mean, we all have a degree of that, right? We do it in our homes, usually. A spouse will try to make sure the other spouse knows they're doing dishes by clanging the dishes a little louder in the kitchen or something or slamming the door. Or stuff like that, right? We want people to know that we're working hard for them. Look, these guys used to leverage those rules. They would do a couple of things. They, they would either use those rules against anyone who was opposed to them, their enemies. They would take those rules, wait till someone got caught in them, use it to catch them and then persecute them. Or they would uh, extort money from people through the use of these rules. It was all a big game for these guys. So naturally, if that's the kind of heart these guys had, their system reflected that. And Jesus says, you want to know what kind of system I'm offering you? It's one that reflects the heart of God. That was the system Israel suffered under. And Jesus said to the crowds, if you're weary of that stuff, if you've had enough of this, guess what? i got a solution for you. I'm offering you something that takes you out from these burdens, makes your life light and easy. And then he makes this comment. He says, I will give you rest. Rest. Now, his mention of rest here brings us to our discussion of the second major reason why Jesus was rejected by the people of Israel and particularly by the Jewish authorities. And here's the reason. The Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. That one day a week that God gave to the nation of Israel. And more specifically, it was Jesus' refusal to acknowledge the myriad of Pharisaic rules associated with Sabbath observation. That was the second reason that they got that the crowds and that the leadership rejected him. Because, friends, if there was ever a day of the week when the average Jew felt the full burden of Pharisaic Judaism, it was the Sabbath day. In the law of God, as you know, God directed Israel that they would cease from work on the seventh day of their week, which began sundown on Friday night. So when the sun sets on Friday until the sun sets again on Saturday, for that 24-hour period, they were to do no work. Here's what the law, and it's, it's repeated at various places, but here's where it first is given in the law, Exodus 20. The Lord says to Israel in 20, Exodus 20, verse 8, He says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. All right, now that's the command. I'm sure you've all heard it, or some version of that. And despite how simple that is, the rabbis soon made that very complicated. In fact, the Pharisees considered Sabbath observance to be God's most important law. Did you know that? If I asked you to predict which of the laws of the Bible the Pharisees said was the number one law, you would not have picked Sabbath, I'm pretty sure. But that's the answer they would give you. That day was so special to a rabbi in Jesus' day that they actually, the day itself actually became a personification of God to them. Uh, they used to refer to the Sabbath day as the Bride of Israel. Or other times they would call it the Queen of Yahweh. In fact, did you know today if you go to a Sabbath observance at a synagogue on Friday night, there's a point in the service where the doors are, are opened up, thrown open, as they sing, the congregation sings a song in Hebrew, and this is the title of it, Welcome, my beloved, let us greet Queen Sabbath. That still goes on today. That's still how they see it. Now the question then is, why were the Pharisees so enamored with the Sabbath? Why did that catch their attention? Well, here's why, friends. Because God's prohibition against work on that day offered them endless opportunities to craft new regulations. It's a gold mine. If you're in the mindset to create rules, you can't do better than a Sabbath day. Because under Pharisee Judaism, there were more rules devoted to the keeping of the Sabbath day than to any other area of Jewish life. By one scholar's count, the Mishnah recorded 1,500 rules for how to go through one Sabbath day. And that just wasn't for the Pharisees, that was for every Jew. In fact, even today, the practice of Judaism, by those who practice it in in an observant way, a religious way, the Judaism you see today is largely defined by three things. Feasts, dietary restrictions, and Sabbath observance. That's pretty much what it means to be Jew in most places today. So for that reason, the enforcement of all of those Sabbath rules by the Pharisees was critical to their power game among the people. Breaking any of those rules... The myriad of rules they came out with for the Sabbath could result in severe penalties, including even death. And so it had everyone's attention, and everyone feared the consequences of breaking a Sabbath rule. And with so many rules, you could do it without even knowing. They were coming up with new ones every week. And so that gave the Pharisees great control over the people through fear. So ironically, the day that God appointed for rest had become a burdensome day of the week for Jews. More so than any other day. Now, Jesus comes along. And Jesus doesn't want to play that game. In fact, Jesus doesn't care a bit about any of those 1,500 whatever rules. They're not from God. They're man-made nonsense. And breaking one of those is not equivalent to breaking the Sabbath. Right? That's not the same thing. It's just somebody's made up little system. Those 1,500 rules became the issue. The Sabbath, Jesus knew was intended as a day of refreshment. And what the Pharisees has done is turned it into a day of fretting and worry and and busyness trying to make sure you did all the things the law required. And even the slightest deviation from those 1,500 rules made the possibility of condemnation happen, right? So it was not a refreshing day. It was a burdensome day. And his refusal to keep up with that system is what put him at odds with the Pharisees and set him on a course to the cross with them. In the Gospels, if you go through the Gospels looking at this issue specifically, you find that most of the disputes that are recorded in the Gospels between Jesus and the Pharisees center on Jesus violating one of those 1,500 Sabbath day rules. And it was almost as if Jesus invited them. Jesus seemed to like to to sort of poke them in the eye over their Sabbath day rules. The most common violation that he was guilty of in their mind was healing. On the Sabbath. Now, the the Pharisees had decided that healing was a form of work. Well, which is ridiculous, right? Because if you have the power to heal from God, and God is the one who set the Sabbath rules, and yet He's letting you heal on the Sabbath, isn't that proof that God's okay with you healing on the Sabbath? But that doesn't register for them because they had a, a rule book. This is how they did things. So, from that point on, in fact, when you get to chapter 12, we're going to see this. The first two things in chapter 12, the chapter that sets up His rejection, are Sabbath day conflicts. And in those Sabbath day conflicts, as you come out of them, we'll see this when we get there, you come out of that with the Pharisees plotting to kill 
Jesus. That was the tipping point. That was the issue. You can, you can go around, you can have crowds, you can have people talking to you, you can heal, you can do all that stuff, fine. But as soon as you start violating our Sabbath rules and flaunting it, okay, now we're not going to have that anymore. That's when the Pharisees decided this guy had to die. Now, Christ knew this. He knew that the, the way that the Pharisees had structured the Sabbath day rules was going to be a major source of contention. And so he would invite that conflict. He would actually intentionally wait till there were Pharisees around before he did a healing on a Sabbath so as to get them involved in these moments. And when Jesus turns to the crowd here, and this is the point, when he looks at them and he says, I've got a system that's light and easy, and you know what? Take my system and you can have rest again. You can have rest again. He is making a subtle reference to the Pharisees' Sabbath rules when he says rest. That's a reference to Sabbath. In fact, notice in verses 28 and 29 tonight, the ones we've read tonight, notice he uses the term rest twice in those short verses. And at the end of 28, he uses it. Then again at the end of 29. And in 29, he's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 6 when he does that. And notice also in verse 29, when he quotes from Jeremiah, he, he says, rest for your souls. So if you glance ahead to chapter 12 for just a second, flip, scroll, swipe, look at chapter 12, verse 8. And at the end of the first conflict with the Pharisees in the Sabbath conflict, notice how he finishes his address to them. He says, the Messiah is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now we're going to study that passage the week after Easter, but for now, let's understand this. Jesus is trying to explain to this crowd the true purpose of Sabbath and why his system makes the Sabbath restful, whereas the Pharisees' system didn't. He's talking about offering Israel rest, not just from the Mishnah and all of the rules of the Pharisees. He's talking about the true spiritual purpose here of Sabbath. And this is the Sabbath every Christian has. He's offering himself as the true Sabbath. The Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath. And this is much greater than the daily observance that we have seen in the the law of Moses. To get a full explanation of this tonight, that is, to get into chapter 12, to understand why the Sabbath is the major contributor putting Jesus on the cross, what we have to understand is what Sabbath actually means. Because the term is kind of loaded, in my experience, in the church. Depending on where you've gone, depending on what you've heard, depending on what people have taught you, you may have a bunch of different ideas about Sabbath. Let's understand what the Bible has to say about it. What do you think? We find that in chapter 4 of Hebrews. So I'm going to put that up on the screen because you're not used to being in Hebrews. You may, uh, you, know, you may have only brought in uh, something with Matthew on it tonight. I'm not sure. But I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 4 for a minute. We need to understand how Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And why his yoke is easy. I'm just going to read chapter 4, verse 1, all the way to verse 10, and you'll see it on the screen. He says, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may have seemed to come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, Just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered into his rest has also himself rested from his works as God did from his. This is typical for the book of Hebrews. A lot of material packed in a short series of verses, often confusing. But the fun of this is sort of unfolding it, almost like unfolding a map. That's what we want to do here tonight. So here's what the writer was concerned with. We dropped into the middle of something. I want to help you understand why we dropped in. Here's what was going on at the beginning of chapter 4. As the writer was writing to this, to, to the churches of the diaspora, the, the places in, in what we consider today Turkey, where they had Jews living outside the land, many of them now having come, come to faith in Christ. And the writer is writing to those Jewish Christians. And he's talking to them about a, a, an experience from Jewish history. And at the end of chapter 3... He starts in chapter 4 saying that uh, he was concerned that some in the church in his day had come short 
of entering into Christ's rest. And he draws from an example in the Old Testament, actually several examples in this chapter, to explain what he means by coming short of God's rest. Because before you can understand why Jesus was challenging the Pharisees on their use of Sabbath rules, why he was offering a better system, you first need to understand why did God give Israel the Sabbath in the first place? What was the whole point? And that starts here in Hebrews, in the first couple of verses. Verses 2 and 3. He says, Those who believe in the good news preached are entering Christ's rest. See that? But in verse 2, he refers to those in Israel's past who had also had the good news preached to them, but they did not enter into his rest. Now, what he's referring to is the generation of Israel that came out of Egypt in the Exodus. How do I know that? Well, it's in chapter 3 of this book. If you go back one chapter, you see that that's who he's talking about. So you know that story, right? Charlton Heston and the Pharaoh and all the rest, right? You have a group of Israel that had been in Israel in Egypt for a time, slaves. Moses comes, frees them, they leave, they come through the Red Sea, they end up at Mount Sinai, they get the law. And at some point after that, it's time for them to enter into the Promised Land, as God promised. They get to the border of the Promised Land, they send spies in to kind of check it out before they go in. The spies come back, and what do they say? Well, the spies who came back told Israel that you don't want to go in there because there's giants. They lied. They said there's giants. There were no giants. It was a lie. They lied. There's giants. Oh, there's terrible things. You don't want to go in there. Stay away. Oh, you know, bad danger. Will Robinson, danger. And they were standing outside. They're going, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. Now, two of the spies were saying, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Go in. But ten said, no, 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 you don't want to go in. They believed the ten, not the two. More importantly, they believed the spies, not God. God said, this is a land of milk and honey. God said, this is the place I've promised your forefathers. This is the place I've prepared for you. And they said, nah, it sounds bad. And so they refused to go. The writer is reminding Israel, the readers, Jewish believers, that that generation did not enter into the land. They ended up dying in the desert because of unbelief. And now in chapter 4, the writer goes on to say, they had good news preached to them. Now, the good news that was preached to that generation of Israel was that God was setting them free from Pharaoh and he was giving them a life in the promised land and he was promising them that that land would be good. But they didn't believe the promise of God. All right, they believed the spies instead. So because of their unbelief, the Lord didn't allow them to enter into the land. They died for their unbelief. Now, that establishes a principle here that the, Lord, that the writer is going to use to teach us about Sabbath. He says in verse 3, in this principle, To believe in the promises of God is to enter his rest. All right, that's a principle that he builds on. And to prove the principle, he now starts to quote from some things in the Old Testament. Starting in in Psalm 95, where in Psalm 95, it's a retelling of the story of the Exodus in that psalm, with some commentary added. And in that psalm, you find the Lord saying, the generation that failed to come through the exodus and into the land, that they were barred from the promised land because, he says, they did not believe. All right. Now, we know that the land that they couldn't enter into is the land of Canaan, the land that is still today even referred to as Israel, most of it. And the Lord says they could not enter that land, that rest. But he is euphemistically referring to, to the promised land as rest, euphemistically. And he connects three ideas in this way. This is what the writer is connecting. Belief is equal to entering rest, and entering rest is equal to getting into the promised land. All right, hold those three thoughts in your mind for just a second. Trust me when I tell you we're going somewhere you're going to want to be when we get there. (laughs) It just doesn't look like it yet, I know. Let me ask you this question then. If faith gets you rest, and rest is equivalent to the promised land, what does rest mean specifically? What rest is he talking about? Well, the writer wanted you to get the right idea. So he starts to explore what it could mean. And he dismisses a couple of ideas, a couple of possibilities along the way. Because he knows these are possibilities you might have. And he, he puts them out as a possibility, and then he looks at them against Scripture, and he says, nope, can't be that one. And he puts out a second one, nope, can't be that one. And then he leads you to the truth. We've got to go down that path with him. So what's the first way that the writer could be describing rest when he says, enter into my rest? What kind of rests are there? 
Well, the writer says, well, there, was the one, there is that place where God says he finished his work and he rested, speaking of the creation itself, the six days of creation. You remember, God worked for six days, in a sense, making the world. And then at the end of that six days, on the seventh day, the Bible says he ceased from his work. That's a kind of way of saying he rested, right? So in that sense, he entered a state of rest. Has he, has he ever gone back to working again? Has he ever had to go back and start the creation again? No. So in that sense, the rest that God began after the creation is still ongoing. It's never stopped. He's been at rest in that sense ever since, right? So you could say all of the creation has been in the rest of God since the seventh day. Because he's not working and we're in the real world that he made, so we're all resting as God ceases from his work of creation. The writer says in verses 4 and 5, that can't be the rest that God is saying we have to enter by faith. He says, because in, in, in Psalm 95, God says he ceased from the work of creation back in Genesis, but then in the Exodus account, God said to Israel, you can't enter my rest. You follow the logic? If the rest referred to the creation rest, you can't tell someone later after that rest has started, you're not able to enter. They were already in that rest. Everyone is by definition. So there must be something else that we're talking about that's not the creation rest there's some other rest and so the writer concludes in verse 6 there must be some other kind of rest that Israel has to enter into a rest of some kind that the earlier generation did not enter into so then we go to the next thing we say well well, perhaps he's just referring to the land itself perhaps entering the promised land is what he means by entering rest they're going to rest in the land maybe that's what it means well and then he considers that possibility to just to be in the land means to be at rest. Well, then he quotes from Psalm 95 again. Now, who wrote Psalm 95? If you don't know, if you don't know who wrote any of the Psalms, there's one guy you can name. You're almost always right, David. David, in this case, did write Psalm 95. And in verse seven of Hebrews, the writer quotes again from Psalm 95, where David says to his brethren in Israel, "Don't harden your hearts like that prior generation of our forefathers did." when they didn't believe. Instead, David tells Israel, you should believe, saying today, if you hear God's voice, respond in faith so that you can enter into his rest. Now, now look at this issue, friends. If entering rest meant entering the promised land, where was David when he wrote that psalm? He was in the promised land, along with all the other Jews. So if entering rest meant being in the land, they were already in the land. And yet there's David writing saying, you need to enter his rest. So his rest can't refer to the creation rest. His rest can't refer to the land itself. Because in both cases, people were still telling Israel, enter, enter, enter. What is it he's asking them to enter into? Look, he says uh, in verse 8, if Joshua, who's the one who led them in, to the promised land? If Joshua had given them rest by bringing them into the land, then David wouldn't have spoken of another day later. He wouldn't have had to say anything about it. So God's rest cannot mean the promised land. It cannot mean sharing in God's rest of creation. It must mean there is still, he says in verse 9, there must still be a Sabbath rest for God's people. Now look in the context of what we just covered, what that means. He did not just say, as some people would tell you, that the writer just advocated that we all take one day a week and rest. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, entering God's rest is still something people have to be called into doing, whatever it is. It's not something that's already been achieved. You can't enter it by entering a certain physical place on earth. You don't enter it by simply being in the creation God made. There's something that today he asks us not to harden our hearts against. Something we have to do. Something we have to be a part of, apparently. So what does God mean by enter his rest? Well, it's something that requires faith. We saw that earlier. Because of unbelief, the generation of Israel that was in the desert did not enter rest. So it has to require faith. And that leaves us with only one conclusion. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so entering rest means trusting in Jesus Christ. Faith in the promises of God specific to the promise of Messiah And as the one who has faith in Christ enters into his rest, the writer says he is the one who rests from his works just like God rested from his. Do you see that in the text of Hebrews? Here's what the writer is saying. The writer is saying that the works that religious people do in an attempt 
to make themselves approved to God is a never-ending burden that you need to have rest from. And the only way to have rest from that burden of rules and regulations and good works and, and, and all the things we do thinking we're pleasing God, the only way to have that rest is to put your faith in the one who did all the work for you. That the true Sabbath rest for God's people is putting faith in Christ's work on our behalf. Jesus looked at the crowd in his day and he told them, all those heavy burdens you guys are getting weary under, that, they have, that the Pharisees have put on your back, I'll remove them for you. Come to me, learn from me, take my yoke. I'll become your Sabbath rest because I'll do all the work that you're trying to do. And then having put your faith in me and receiving that rest, having gained credit for all of my work, you now have a light yoke. You don't have anything you have to do. That's the rest of God. That's what it means to be in a Sabbath. Knowing you do not have to work your way to heaven, someone's done the work for you. Now, had the Jews of Christ's day understood this and accepted his offer, they would have set aside all the works of the Mishnah, and they would have thrown all the rules of Sabbath out, and they would have, in fact, they would have set aside the whole law of Moses, because Christ had accomplished it for them. And they would have done what David had called his countrymen to do. They would have rested in the promises of God in the man Messiah. And that's what the earlier generation missed. They missed the opportunity to rest by their faith in the God that had freed them from Egypt. Now, speaking of that generation, we're also learning that God used their experience in the desert as a powerful picture of how faith brings us rest. And this is the part I don't want you to leave without. In the Exodus story, remember, they entered the promised land of Canaan. And we're told, as they did that, we're told, they did what the prior generation did not. Now, if you don't know the story, there was a generation that left Egypt. They died in the desert. Their children, the next generation were the ones who actually were allowed to enter into the promised land. Of course, that first generation was led by Moses. The second generation, though, was led by Joshua, you remember? Because Moses died and was not permitted to enter into the promised land. That first generation didn't get in because they didn't have faith, because they had no belief or faith in Christ's promises. And in the fact that it took faith to enter into the promised land, God creates a beautiful picture there. The picture is simply this. By faith, you enter God's rest, and that rest assures you the kingdom, the promised land. But without faith, you cannot enter the kingdom. You cannot enter the promised land. And you arrive at a fundamental truth of, of the Bible. Faith is salvation. Salvation is a promise to enter the kingdom when it arrives on earth. And to make the picture even clearer, I love this detail in the scripture. Moses did not get the people into the promised land. Joshua did. Now, Moses personifies the law, right? We call it the law of Moses. People talk about doing the law as doing what Moses commanded. Moses is the poster child of the law. And friends, the law, rules, regulations, the law doesn't get you into the promised land. If you're following Moses, as in following the law, you'll never get into the promised land. But who did get the people of God into promised land? Joshua. And Joshua's name is the English version of what name? Yeshua, which is the name Jesus. Who does get you into the promised land? Following Jesus. Following, as it were, Joshua in his day. You can't get God's rest by doing works. It's counterintuitive. You rest by trusting in God to do the work for you in the form of Christ. And so here's why God gave Israel the Sabbath day. He gave them a Sabbath day to picture Jesus as their Sabbath. One day a week... Every week, the nation of Israel was to follow in God's footsteps. God created for six days, rested for seven. They would do all their work in six days, they'd rest for seven. But in the process, he was teaching Israel a lesson. You have to enter into the kind of rest God provides for you. If you put your faith in Christ, you can enter into a rest that never ends. You know, the one they gave you once a week, you wake up the next day, you start all over again. The one that you get by faith in Christ, you never start again. It's a permanent rest. If you put your faith in Christ, you stop working your way to heaven. You are in your Sabbath. Now, if anyone has ever pressured you to keep a Sabbath day of rest, I'm not going to take hands because I'm pretty sure many of them would go up. If you've ever had that experience in a church, guess what? You now know what a yoke feels like. That's what it feels like to wear a yoke. And that's ironic because that person may have wanted you to experience refreshment, or so they told you, because they presented it to you, though, as a mandatory rule. It actually ended up being a burden. Think about it for a moment. That's how law works. Laws exist to convict you when you fail. They do not make obedience easier. 
Not in and of themselves. So when someone told you to keep a Sabbath day, and they said that's a requirement of God, and it's to help you feel better, guess what you felt? Burdened. Constrained. Pressured. And of course, the days you did not rest, for whatever reason, then you felt guilty. That's not the experience of following Christ. Either way, that's a burden. That is a mini Pharisaic moment that you remember now and you can experience. And tonight, friends, hear Jesus' words again. His yoke is light. It's easy. Every day with Christ is a Sabbath. Every day, because He kept all those burdens for you. He took the law and did it for you. By faith, you're freed from all of that. And its place, you have a life where you can live for His glory, following His Spirit, not worrying about keeping some old law written for a group of people who you're not even a part of years ago in another part of the world. It's not for you. Now, if you want to take a day off every week, go for it. You know what I want to do? I want to take six days off a week and only work one. Oh, wait, I'm a pastor. I already have that job. Oh, and here's the conceit of this. You couldn't keep the Sabbath even if you tried. If you think you're keeping the Sabbath, this is my favorite part. Christians say, oh, I keep a Sabbath. I'm rigorous. Oh, do you now? Do you know that keeping Sabbath is not the equivalent of going to church? In fact, to go to church, you have to break the Sabbath. Because Sabbath's no driving, no cooking, no emailing, turn your phone off, no web surfing, no yard work, no working out at the gym, no hunting, no fishing, no riding bikes, no homework, no chores, no work. Done any of that on a, quote, Sabbath, whatever day you call your Sabbath? You broke the Sabbath. Stop trying to do something you can't do, that you don't have to do, that Christ did for you, and start living for Christ. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You can take any day off you want, but it's not a religious act. It's a vacation. And do it as much as you can. More power to you. But don't get your theology messed up by it. May I humbly suggest that this one example that we finish with tonight is a good example of why this church exists. In my opinion, my humble opinion, or at least why it needs to exist. Biblical ignorance leads people to accept burdens or put burdens on other people that Christ did not give us, burdens like the Pharisees were giving to Israel. And ignorance also prevents Christians from obeying him in ways that he did intend, serving him seven days a week, if that's what God wants. Understanding the Bible does two things, friends. It removes those unnecessary burdens to make room for people who want to serve Christ in joy and in freedom. The the Sabbath is just one example of that. If nothing else today, you go away with one less burden on your shoulder that should never have been there in the first place. When you accepted Christ, you found your Sabbath, and you're in it every minute of every day. Praise the Lord. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, that Christ did this work for us. Thank you that we are not sitting here today struggling under the yoke and the burden of rules that we couldn't keep if we tried. Thank you, Father, that our salvation doesn't depend on our performance to those rules. And thank you, Father, for the scripture that tells us the truth of these things so that we're not deceived by those who don't understand the truth. Father, for any in here who have found themselves struggling under these burdens and perhaps now, Father, are feeling the freedom, the weight lifted off their shoulders, Father, I pray that you would encourage them all the more that following Christ is not about no structure, no limits, no no rules. It's about following a spirit who tells us what to do at every minute of every day. It just doesn't require the burden of other people's rules. Help them understand, Father, that they serve you in obedience in new and better ways than old laws and dead rules. And help us, Father, to show others that this kind of life is a life that pleases you, reflects your heart. You want us to succeed in in our obedience, Father. You don't want us to stumble. And so you've given us the means in Christ to do just that. We thank you, Father, for that. Help our little church continue to grow and to reach the needs of those in this community who want to know the word with us. Bless us as we do that work, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.